Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Today is June 15th, um, 2023. Um, before we start, I just want to say that um, for those of you who are joining us remotely, we just ask that you uh, be aware um, and keep yourself muted. Uh, if you do want to address the commission, please raise your hand. We'll call on you. You can unmute or we can do it from this. And I think, right, Dylan? And um, we'll ask for your uh, questions or your comments or concerns. Um, we ask that you try not to talk over each other because we want to make sure that we have a clear record uh, for our recording secretary and our minutes. All right. I will say that um, there's a couple of item issues that I just want to bring up. Um, we are going to be postponing the minutes uh, that were set to be approved, minutes from the June 1st meeting. Um, and so we will not be taking a vote on that. And uh, that is item four on our agenda. And also there's a public hearing or, uh, for a subdivision of Kokomo Brothers Wilkes Pound Road, but the applicant has requested uh, that the hearing be continued. So we won't even be discussing that at all. So if you're here for any of those items, um, they will not be part of this meeting. All right. And so I'll ask uh, that we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance before we dig in. Thank you. Also, because we have um, some of our regular uh, members, uh, Brian Rogan and also Scott Hamill, who is not here yet. Um, we're hoping he shows up, but I'm going to ask Steve Biella, who's our alternate. Steve, you're online. Yep. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, good okay. Evening. All right. Do save, save your voice. We know you have um, laryngitis. I've informed the group. So, but we appreciate you being here and offering any comments as you can. All right. Terrific. What? Oh, yes. And the other thing I wanted to bring up, and this is more for, okay. Just everyone silence your cell phones, please. Um, so that we don't have any interruptions. Um, thank you. All righty. So we've done, we'll ask for, we, I, I think we actually did the roll call, but go ahead. Okay. June Daly. Here. Andrew Lou Millard. Here. Ann Jorsey. Here. Jim Zygmunt. Here. Ryan Rogan. They come, but not yet. Um, Chairman Veely. Here. Scott Hamill. Not here. Steve Biella is here. We heard him speak and we hear it. We understand he's having difficulty communicating um, by voice. Um, and John Dakin. Dakin. Yeah, which I think is, I think he's making an attempt to get here, but that's good. That's good. Okay, uh, moving on, we have the uh, scheduling of public hearings. We have the proposed text amendment of Newport 848 Farmington Avenue, LLC, to amend section 8F of the Berlin zoning regulations. Now, the suggested date for this is the 20th of July. Um, so I guess, do we have a motion or concerns or? Whatever. Make a motion to schedule a public hearing July 20th. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Jorsey. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Zigma. Further discussion? And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? <laughs> so moved. On to commission business. The first is a review and recommendation in accordance with 824 of the Connecticut General Statutes for a lot line revision to add 0.25 acre portion of 143 Percival Avenue to Percival Field Parcel Map 8-4, Block 54, Lot 69, for the sale of the 143 Percival Avenue which happens to be 4.65 acres after the lot line revision and for the lease of a 4.15 acre portion of Percival Field, parcels map 8-4, block 54, lot 65 of all the shown. The survey of Angus McDonald. Uh, please, if you're online and joining us, please uh, mute your microphone as we're having feedback here. Thank you. Survey of Angus McDonald, Gary Sharp, and, and Associates Incorporated. This was dated 
October 4th, 2017. All right. So. So I'm, um, I'm not sure if Jim wants to take this or he wants me to take it. Jim Mahoney's online and he's actually, I think, much probably smoother as far as describing what's happening. But um, I'll give a little background. Um, a number of years ago, um, the Knights of Columbus was a parcel was approved for a senior housing development. And it part of that approval included some transfer of property to the housing authority from the town and how that would all work out as they're we're getting closer and closer to um, moving forward with um, development of the parcel, hopefully for senior housing. Um, there's been um, some items to rectify with regard to the use of the field and where the lot line is in relation to the field <clears throat> that exists, as well as an easement area and um, the lease line versus um, what's going to be sold to the housing authority ultimately for the development. So um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna turn that to Jim. Uh, let me just say, I took the map that I believe you all received or that was actually included in the in your packet. Mm -hmm. There's another map that isn't marked up. I marked it up in areas just so that you could delineate what is going on. It was very hard to see with the weights of the lines in the original drawing. Uh, we do have a better drawing we can bring up if necessary to zoom in on. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Mahoney. Thank you. Yes, um, <clears throat> the Planning and Zoning Commission has seen this and uh, for 824 reviews in 2010 and 2014, but the um, project is somewhat modified since then. So uh, the council recently authorized the town manager to close on the property once the the, ho the housing authority has financing. And I know Joe, Joe Bajorski's on, but he can elaborate if you need. But I believe that they plan on closing on their financing in July. So that is coming up. And so we evaluated the old, old uh, A24s and decided we needed a new A24 review. As Maureen said, <clears throat> I'd describe it in three parts. One is there's a portion of the Percival Field baseball field that's actually on the 143 former Knights of Columbus property. So the first thing we're gonna do, yes, thank you. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna revise the lot lines to keep all the baseball field, uh, I put all the baseball field on the Percival Field property, okay? So that will uh, avoid any uh, batted balls or having to move the fences in in the future or whatever. So we get that straightened out. Uh, so, then the second, okay. yeah, go ahead. Um, so that's the pink line on the colored map. Yeah, just not the, yeah, just the top part of the pink line. That, oh, just the um, top part, yeah, sorry. Yeah, just that, that little triangle up there. Yeah, right, where the baseball field is. So then uh, the second change is that we determined that a portion of the property that was to be sold to the housing authority that uh, former so that next to the former uh, next to the soccer field, that yellow area, is actually encumbered by an ease uh, conservation easement to the state of Connecticut because we got funding for uh, field improvements on Percival Avenue, on uh, Percival Field. So therefore, we put a conservation easement on that whole parcel. So we couldn't sell the parcel to the housing authority. So we went through some negotiations with the. Uh, to the State Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, and they agreed to allow um, a 30-year lease with renewals. So the way we're structuring this is that we would sell the former Knights of Columbus, the green portion, that is less the, less the little sliver we're keeping for Percival Field, right? And we would lease the housing authority, the yellow portion, which right now is is uh, you know basically south of the soccer field. It's a wooded area. You can see there's some wetlands on either side of that. But uh, they, as I understand, they they would plan to do like walking trails, that sort of thing through that area. And it, and it kind of goes between um, you know the Knights of Columbus and their Marjorie Moore 
uh, property. So that, it makes sense in that in that regard. So um, that's the, it's kind of a three part thing. First thing we're going to do is revise those lot lines, and then we would uh, convey the Knights of Columbus property and the lease and lease the portion of personal field to the housing authority so that they can develop um, affordable senior housing. And I know uh, that Joe's going to be back in front of you in the near future, hopefully, uh, with some revisions to his plan. He's going to be doing um, 52 units is the plan instead of 50 and, and the like. So they'll be presenting new site plans and, and uh, special permit plans, et cetera. But that uh, that will be subsequent to the closing of the financing. Okay, Happy to answer any you. questions. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, where is uh, Marjorie Moore? On, on, I just want to make yeah, sure. I'm east, in the right yeah, place. yeah, like east of the yellow line there. It's at the bottom of the the bottom of the page, right? Wait, yeah, that's the soccer field, and then below the soccer field, like kind of, you know, it would be just yeah, right, right down to the in that area, right? Yeah, where the All cursor right. is, that's Marjorie Moore property right there. Okay, yes, Marjorie. yes. <clears throat> Can I also see where the, um, I want to see where the wetlands is on this. I just, so we, we could. It's in gray, shaded. Yeah. In, the, yeah. in the shade of gray. So right. they're proposing that if the leased area is approved, that they'll be doing walking trails. So are they going to have to bridge over the wetlands? No, they probably walk around it. I mean, basically right now there's a. I mean. There's a kind of a trail around the perimeter on that on that um, let's say um, south side of the soccer field outside the fence. Um, so they'll have to loop it back. And we're actually, as you I, I you probably remember, we we did a new uh, walking bridge from the town hall to uh, over a purse toward Percival Field recently, mm -hmm. and uh, we got an easement from the housing authority to to create a connection. So that we can go from the town hall complex, the library, et cetera, and walk over to Percival Field. And then there is a concept that, you know, their um, Parks and Rec is doing a project where they're improving the soccer field. And uh, we did have a bid alternate for continuing the trail out in the other direction toward the pool, which was above the price, but we're probably going to do it as a separate project. So we'll be talking to you about that in the future. But long and short of it is we would. I would expect that the walking trails will come back, you know, to the perimeter of the soccer field at the um, southeast corner um, of the leased property, and then connect into these trails that we're we're developing to connect to both to Marjorie Moore and to the town hall complex. Okay, thank you. And, and Joe can else? correct me. Joe could correct me if I'm wrong. No, okay. you're right. Um, so if you look on the map, you'll see the pink uh, border. That's where the, the, the trails would come in from the town property onto the conserved property. Uh, mm -hmm. So we wouldn't have to cross any wetlands. Uh, and the, the trail would basically run alongside the property line roughly uh, and access both personal field and the, um, housing, the housing authority, uh, Knights of Columbus property. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions from the commission? No, I'm no. I was just curious, and maybe I wasn't following. But so it's if it's being leased, then it's private. It'll be considered private for the trails. No, there was still public access. Correct, Joe. Yeah, that's correct. We do we do what we did with the Marjorie Moore Trail, and basically, you know, I guess come up with an agreement or an easement. Easement, um, yeah. Easement or a separate agreement basically governing the use and the access of the trails and maintenance and things like that. Okay. The, the town would still retain ownership of the land um, because of the way this project developed, the ground, it, the site's already been approved. It's been through planning and zoning and the entire part, the entire two parcels are part of that site plan. So in order to break it apart would be prohibitively expensive from the uh, consulting engineer standpoint and the, you know, we are actually using part of the uh, lease land for stormwater retention. So it creates some issues. So the ground lease allows us to continue using this parcel for our site plan approval. 
and uh, the town still retains it ownership to it. Um, and, you know, the trails will allow the public access to that upland area between the two weapons. Okay, thank you. Uh, Diane, I think, did you have a question? Uh, no, I'll make a motion. Oh, okay. Anyone else have questions? All righty. Okay, terrific. Steve Bayel, I'll just ask Steve. I know you're online. Did you have any questions? I'm also chosen. Okay, thank you. I know that's maybe i should just say yes or no i know i know just say yes or no okay thank you go ahead poor guy i know i know go ahead uh diane uh i'll make a motion to um recommend approval um of the section 824 uh for proposed lot revision lot line revision um to add a quarter acre portion of 143 percival avenue to percival field um, and for the sale of 143 Percival Avenue of 4.65 acres after the lot line revision and for the lease of a 4.15 acre portion of Percival Field, um, as shown on the survey of Angus McDonald, Gary Sharp, and Associates Incorporated from October 4th, 2017. Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Jorsey. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Millard. Further discussion? Then all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. All righty. <clears throat> on to new business. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, on to Thank new you, business. Everyone. All right. Good night. Uh, the fill permit of the Mattabasset District to fill 18,000 cubic yards over a period of three years. That's 6,000 cubic yards per year at lot two, block 75, uh, route nine. Okay. Hi. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Art Simonian with Mattabasset District, 245 Main Street in Cromwell. Mm -hmm. With me is John Dunham, our board chairman, a resident of Berlin as well. Uh, we're here tonight. Uh, we come every three years to get a fill permit renewed for our ash uh, that we haul over to the uh, Edgewood landfill. Uh, just a quick little history on the landfill. Uh, it was actually purchased in 1982. Um, there were some state funds that were involved that granted uh, Mattabasset the uh, the landfill for use, strictly used uh, for ash only and uh, any cover material. Um, it's uh, strictly for the Mattabasset district uh, for uh, film material. Um, so we have uh, a place for our ash, which comes out of the incinerator um, every year. And we haul approximately about five to 6,000 cubic yards per year, um, usually in the summertime over to the uh, Edgewood landfill. And again, this is for an 18,000 yard, three year uh, fill permit. There should be a drawing in your package that looks like this. And um, the area that we'll be filling in is coming from Edgewood Avenue heading kind of south. And then you turn to the west, there's a dashed line that says area filled from previous survey. We're gonna be filling back in that same area. There's still quite a bit of capacity there. And um, if you're interested in, as far as the capacity of the land of the landfill itself, there's some um, tables at the bottom. Um, they're a little small for my eyes, but uh, it says that we so far filled about 130,000 cubic yards and the capacity is about 465,000 cubic yards. And based on our average fill rate in the last, um, um, I can't see if that's 60, uh, 96, but over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, we have about 92 years left in terms of capacity. So um, so we do have um, plenty of room. There are monitoring wells there as well that we have to test for to meet all state requirements. We do that quarterly as well as annually. And the trucks that uh, haul the material come out of our site in Cromwell, they get on Route 9 and they get off in New Britain and go down, um, I think it's, um, it's John Downey Drive, um, uh, I forgot the name of the street before there. Maybe um, where A.H. Harris uh, is down that street there. Um, and then turn into Edgewood to bring the material into the landfill. Um, so it's um, there's really no debris or anything that gets out of the trucks. They're all watertight. Everything is drained uh, as far as liquids at the uh, ash, uh, at the uh, lagoons where Mattabasset's located. And uh, they're purely hauling the ash material, um, but they do have to make sure their trucks aren't, you know, dirtied all the tires. They have a cleaning area 
like a tracking pad that's built uh, by the entrance and also by where the fill goes. They have like an unloading area that they build uh, that worked out very well last year. So we have the same contractor doing the work for the last uh, two years, and he's done the work years in the past as well. So we're pretty happy with his quality of his work. So um, that's uh, essentially what we're looking for. Um, we'll give you an as-built as well once we're done. I think that was a condition last year, but we'll certainly be giving, doing an as-built. Um, this project should be done sometime in August or September, and then a couple months to get the as-built done. Um, the, uh, we do have a wetland approval already from 1982 to fill this site up over time. Um, but we'll be developing a, a kind of like a interim grading plan and some drainage plans that will probably go to uh, wetlands um, just so they could see what we're going to do in the future. So. Questions from the commission. Yes, uh, you uh, okay. mentioned the the uh, wells, I mean, the testing of uh, places along the border. Uh, and that has been done quarterly and filed. No yes, problem. file with DEP. Uh, we have to have it. Um, we have to be certified to be able to, uh, to do the collections and we run uh, the tests both in our lab and to an outside lab as well. Um, it's been done since the uh, ash landfill was uh, installed in, in the 80s. So, um, but we meet, have to meet you know permit numbers for that and we don't have any issues meeting all our permit uh, requirements. I'm sorry. Are, um, what's the pattern of the track, uh, the truck traffic? Uh, it comes down Route 9 and gets off. I think it's the old exit 20, uh, 26. I'm sorry. No, it's the left hand exit that gets off by the field, the baseball field in New Britain, Beehive. And then they take a right. Veterans they, Drive. Veterans Drive. And they go down the right and turn down in New Britain. So. Uh, okay. And then I forgot the name of the street that goes east west uh, from um, from uh, the, from where uh, Shaler's is. There's yeah. a street that cuts down that way, so that goes towards uh, Edgewood Avenue. Okay, all right. South Thank Street. You. Thank you. Yep. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, what's the flavor of the commission? Yeah, if you. Um, so I will fun. make a motion to approve the fill permit uh, subject to staff comments. Okay, we have the motion by Ms. Jorsey. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Zygma. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those, those <laughs> opposed? Thank you, Steve. Those opposed, so moved. All right, and uh, just going to pause here because uh, our other alternate, John Dykin, has arrived to the meeting at 728. And um, I'll ask that you be seated um, because we are missing uh, Mr. Hamill and uh, Mr. Rogan tonight. Thank so, you. all right, thank you, no problem. All right, so moving on, we're now on to item uh, thank eight. You. Yes, thank you you're all set, bye -bye. you too. Bye-bye guys. All right, so item eight, we have a request of Joe Klopaki for Edgewood Tower Homes LLC for the release of the erosion control bond 1-30 Edgewood Water Circle, Berlin, which was formerly uh, the Berlin Turnpike numbers of 27, uh, 2718 to 2730 Berlin Turnpike. Okay, so this is, He's looking for the erosion control bond release. And how are we doing with that? So um, I can be succinct and tell you that both the soil erosion control bond as well as the, um, oh, actually, no, let me do the soil erosion control bond. Um, yep. um, engineering has indicated can be released. The site is um, fully occupied and um, and is, they don't, they have all their, They've done everything yeah, they needed to do with regard to, soil to the uh, soil erosion. Okay. Yeah. All right. Questions from the commission regarding the soil erosion? Mr. Make an, uh, I'll make a motion to release uh, the soil erosion control bond. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Jorsey. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. There you go, Mr. Dykin. And um, the discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Steve. So moved. Bless you. All right. Bless you. 
Uh, the second item is a request of Joe Klopacki, Edgewood Water Townhouses LLC, for the release of the public improvements bond, which is 1 30 Edgewood Circle, Berlin, formerly 2718 to 2730 Berlin Turnpike. And how's he doing with that? So, as I stated, he has um, completed and the bond reduction has been shown on your um, in the public improvements. Um, sheet that you've received down to the maintenance bond amount at 10% mm -hmm. for $12,864 to be held for 12 months as a maintenance bond. Okay, so we're basically, yeah, so we're basically releasing everything except for that amount. Except for the retention for um, the maintenance. Okay, sure. all right. And I'm not sure that they, I, I don't know the date that that would have started at because it has been completed. Yeah. For a bit of that's all right. As long as you guys are um, you satisfied. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyone yeah. making a motion? Sure. I'll make a motion, motion to um, release the public improvement bond uh, with the exception of the $12,864 for maintenance. Okay. We have a motion by Ms. Jorsey. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Miller. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed to the vote. Thank you, Steve. All right. Just want him to make sure that he knows that we're listening for him. Uh, public hearings. So um, did we have a call for the public hearing that we need to have read? Uh, yeah, she did. Read into public hearing. Oh, Brian's not there. Brian's not there. Andre, you feel like reading tonight? No, okay. <laughs> okay. Miss Jorsey will read it. <laughs> Back to the old days. Yeah, to the old days. She used to be secretary, so. Okay, well, that's all right. I asked. I, I just figured, you know, right. Don't want to listen to me. <laughs> town, town of Berlin Planning and Zoning Commission notice of public hearings. The Berlin Planning and Zoning Commission will hold public hearing on Thursday, June 15th, 2023 at 7 p.m. in the town council chambers, Berlin Town Hall, 240 Kensington Road, Berlin, Connecticut. Interested parties may join the meeting and participate in the public hearing in person or remotely as provided below. A, subdivision application of Kokomo Brothers for a five lot subdivision at lots 46 and 46D, block 142, 170 Wilkes Pond Road and 243 Somerset Road. B, proposed plan of conservation and development 2023 to 2033. Copies of the proposed draft are posted on the town's website and available for public inspection at the office of the town clerk and planning and zoning department. The applications and related ma meeting materials are available at the Planning and Zoning Department, Berlin Town Hall, 240 Kensington Road, Berlin, Connecticut. Remote access to this meeting is available by Zoom video conference, and the link is provided, uh, and meeting ID, and this ran December, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> ah, I was doing so well. This ran no Good. Uh, the 30th of May, 2023. Um, in uh, Berlin, Connecticut, in the um, New Britain Herald, legal notices, classified advertising. Um, it was run on June 3rd and June 12th. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dorsey. All righty. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just put that back here. Um, should we just make that for, should we just deal with the Kokomo thing first? Because oh, that's going to, you know, yeah, why don't we just go ahead and do that now so that we can dig into the other stuff? Um, so so um, he had requested. to move it up on the agenda? No, well, uh, yeah. Move it up and then vote. Okay. Yes, we do. So I'll make a motion to uh, move item C um, to the first item under public hearings. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, we have a tie. We'll go with Ms. Daly. All right, thank you. Uh, further discussion on moving the item up. Then all those in favor, aye. Those opposed to move. So, thank you, I'll Steve. Make a motion to continue the subdivision application of Kokomo Brothers for a five lot subdivision at lots 46 to 46 feet. And that was by his request. By his request. Okay, terrific. And I just, yes, that, that will then use, let me get to it, 21 of 65 available extension dates to get you to July 6th. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So we have a, mo a so motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Dykin for the discussion. 
Then all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed, so moved. Okay, so let's go back to the regular business. Uh, proposed plan of conservation and development 2023 to 2033. I know I won't be around then. Okay, copies of the proposal draft are posted on the town's website and available for public inspection at the town, at the office of the town clerk in the planning and zoning department. All right, this is, go ahead. Can I add to that? Thing? Yeah. The crowded in the room. That I am going to yeah. be back at 2033. We hope so. Wheel me in, baby. Um, <laughs> there are prints of it in case anyone needs yes. to follow through with it. Or if any of you want a print, I do have some. some okay. If you don't have them, of the draft that was actually printed on 511. Which we have. <laughs> it's a print, a draft from 331. It is a print from 511. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll stick with my old trusted one. But thank you. In the room, you have um, Ken. Yes, um, Ken. Hi. Ken. Okay. Living. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. And Francisco Gomes, the consultants are here. Too. All right. To wow okay. Who wants to wow first? Ken, are you going to be the wower tonight, or are you going to let Francisco wallow away over there in Zoom land? Ken, Ken will give a brief introduction uh, to FHI, our role in the project, and, and then I'll get into the specifics, um, just walking people through the process we went through. For those of you uh, in attendance that might not have been familiar with the POCD update process. Okay. All right. Terrific. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you um, to everyone. Thank you. So uh, FHI Studio, we are a firm based in, in Hartford, Connecticut. I better take one too. Let's go in ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. I've been working with uh, the, the town, you and others over the last uh, about two years. Um, yeah. Excited that we've come to this point. And You're excited. We're really excited. <laughs> and I think we're very excited that we've sort of followed the schedule and, and things have gone very well. We've enjoyed working with you and, and it's been a great process. So we are at this point where we are looking for adoption of the plan of conservation and development. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, over the course of this time, we've met with uh, with you. We've met with the public. We've met with key stakeholders, done existing conditions, condition um, reviews, and come up with a lot of visions and ideas. And looking forward for the next 10 years while you'll be around to see it all influence yeah. and all the excitement. Of yeah, it. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I didn't think I was going to be here either, so I shouldn't probably. So with that, I think Francisco will get into more of the uh, specific detail for our crowd that we have here. Okay. I'm going to move right. this up. I keep Thank staying you, into this chair, so I'm going to move it around. Okay. Go ahead. All right. I, as, as Ken mentioned, it's been close to two years now. And there's a lot of work that's brought us to this moment. And I'd, I'd like to, uh, for the benefit of everyone uh, attending and, and viewing, I'd like to uh, walk through the POCD update process, talk a little bit about the purpose and the role of the POCD and, and how it is that we came to develop the plan that is in front of you this evening. But first of all, the purpose of the POCD, which stands for Plan of Conservation and Development, it, it is a policy document and it guides the town and its governance and decision making and along the lines of a matter of issues. Land use, most obviously, but also uh, issues related to housing, economic development, town facilities and infrastructure and your cultural resources, and that includes historic properties, districts, your farms, uh, and, and other resources that really make the town uh, what it is and, and give it gives it its sense of place and identity. In addition to that, uh, the Plan of Conservation and Development guides other items and issues related to the growth and stewardship of resources across the town. That's the role of this document. The process we went through to arrive at this plan, uh, as, as Ken mentioned, it's been close to two years, and uh, we've engaged uh, a wide range of people, boards, and commissions in this process. Uh, we, we first started with an online survey 
that we had uh, participation from uh, over a couple hundred people in that survey. We had very good feedback. We conducted a public workshop last year in June, uh, focus group meetings as well last year in June. Um, we had the plan reviewed by both town council and it's been endorsed by town council and reviewed by CROG. And uh, Maureen, I, I don't know if you made mention of the letter that we received from CROG, um, but if, if you have not, now would probably be a good opportunity. So not yet, but that is um, included. Yesterday we received the letter, I guess today we received the letter, redated. Um, today, the um, with the regional plan, or the CROG finding no apparent conflict with the regional plan and policies, and then they go on to make some other comments um, with regard to the, um, the connections and the aligning with the state POCD that yeah, it's been distributed. If you want me to read it out loud, I will. Um, but it seems to be, to be a glowing endorsement. No. Uh, so a review uh, of the plan by the COG, and in this case, Capital Region Council of Governments is, is required. And they, they review the plan for consistency with the regional plan and for the state plan as well. And they found uh, Berlin's plan to be consistent with both. And uh, they endorsed the plan without any reservations, without any requested uh, amendments or changes. And uh, so that, that was a letter that we just received and it was very good to have that endorsement coming in uh, to this hearing. And, and so uh, all of this work, uh, engagement uh, through uh, close to two years with monthly meetings with our POCD committee to uh, review existing conditions, um, review and discuss input received from the public, and to develop the plan's recommendations, and, and ultimately to um, compose and, and format and produce the document. Uh, those meetings, we've had uh, about 20 of those, and so we've met on a regular basis for a while now. Um, and that has brought us to the plan that is before you now. As I mentioned, community engagement uh, was what I described as a full court press, right? We, we made every effort to engage and invite the community to participate in this process. It's, it's always a challenge getting people's attention, particularly with a long range plan. And we made every opportunity available. And that, as I mentioned, included the online survey, the workshop, uh, four thematic meetings. And what that means is we did meetings on uh, topics such as transportation and infrastructure, uh, cultural resources and environmental resources, economic development, housing. Um, and we had in-depth discussions on items related to, the, to those topics. Um, all uh, planning and zoning committee meetings were open to the public. Uh, they were in-person and virtual. We've uh, posted all planned material, including presentations and various documents and reports uh, online and have maintained that uh, available to the public. And the draft POCD was posted uh, for public review for over a month now in hard copy in the town clerk's office and both online. We received uh, a lot of feedback from the community in, in the engagement process. And I, I think this is one of the uh, more important questions that we asked the community. And it really gives us a strong sense as to how receptive the community is to change. And, and what we found in Berlin is that uh, your residents acknowledge the fact that you need to grow and change, but they're incrementalists. And, and that's a healthy thing, right? Mm -hmm. They're cautious ab about change. They wanna make sure as, they, as you grow and change as a community, it's positive, it contributes to your identity. Um, it adds uh, strength to your community. And, it, and mo most importantly, uh, what people express to us is you don't want change to result in loss of your identity as a 
rural suburban community with an agrarian uh, past with functioning farms and a very close knit community. And that doesn't want to be lost. And that was clearly conveyed to us. And, and I believe that the plan really uh, makes recommendations that embraces that concept of maintaining your identity. And so this input was incredibly informative and it really shaped the recommendations that we made in the plan. The plan, uh, in addition to being directed by community input, it was also data-driven. And we did a tremendous amount of research into not only existing conditions and demographics and statistics that are relevant to Berlin today, but we also look back 10, 20, 30 years to understand the trends in how your community has changed over time. And so we pulled from a number of sources and databases, including US census and state level data, and there's the whole list right there. And, and what we see is you are changing and much like people's opinion about change, that it should be incremental. The change in Berlin over time has been incremental. And I think what's most important is that unlike a lot of communities in Connecticut, you have grown consistently over the past 50 or so years. That's plateaued a little bit in the last 10, but the growth been, has been consistent. Um, other things are changing. You know, school enrollment is, is flat, if not slightly declining, but as a community, you're growing. So it's critically important to plan for growth and change in your community because that growth has been happening decade after decade. Mm. The plan itself is divided into six major topic areas, and those comprise sections or chapters of the plan. And for each one of those topic areas, we identified a goal, a specific goal related to each. And, and there they all, all are right there. I'm not gonna read them all word for word, but for environmental resources, really the focus is protecting those environmental resources and expanding protection of open space. For housing, it's increasing the diversity and supply of housing in the town for various people uh, at various levels of income at various stages in their life. For economic development, it's about expanding, diversifying your tax base and providing employment opportunities for your residents. For transportation, it's about adequately maintaining infrastructure, investing in increasing transportation options. For facilities and services, it's having high quality uh, facilities, um, high quality services to residents, and that those are both sustainable, meaning uh, you, year after year, you can afford to maintain, sustain those services, and they're done in a sustainable way. And finally, cultural resources that you protect and promote those resources, whether it be your museums, historic properties, or farms. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, with environmental resources, we, in addition to that broad goal, we've identified a number of specific strategies. And to go into even more detail, specific actions uh, that are necessary, that are part of those strategies that are necessary to achieve the goal. So there are kind of three tiers of, of guidance within the plan. There's the goal, those six broad goals. And then we've identified strategies and that's how you achieve the goal. And then within those strategies, those are comprised of action items. And those are the specific actions that we've identified at this point in the process that are that are necessary uh, to take to action on as part of a strategy working towards those goals. Um, and this is an evolving process. This plan is a snapshot. It's a moment in time. It's intended to be something you can build upon over the over, every year over the next 10 years. And it should continue to evolve and change with your, with your changing needs in the community. So you may identify additional actions that are necessary to take. So as I mentioned, 
uh, for each one of these topic areas, we've identified a number of strategies. There, there's several of them listed right there for environmental resources. Uh, for housing, one of the important strategies for housing is to meet and exceed a supply of 10% of qualified affordable housing, uh, qualified with respect to the state's definition of affordable housing. And that puts Berlin in a position not only provide housing to people who need it and who can't afford housing uh, that is not affordable, but also gives you full control over the development that happens in your community. And finally, with respect to housing, you also have tremendous opportunities in front of you in Kensington Village and in your TOD uh, district in the area around the station to develop housing uh, in relation to transit. Uh, and there are tremendous synergies there. There are some successes that are current that have already have been experienced uh, in that area and, and that are currently unfolding. So um, we, we touch upon that in, in the plan. And the plan, I should note, also uh, builds upon and makes references to your affordable housing plan that we worked with the town to develop and was adopted a, about a year ago. Economic development. Um, it, as I mentioned before, uh, there are lots of opportunities all across the town. The town's been incredibly progressive in this area. That has identified targeted economic development sites with a range, you know, a diversity of economic development, everything from mom and pop shops and restaurants to industrial, large commercial office and mixed use as, if, as in this example. Um, from Kensington Center. Uh, so the, the, the town is very forward thinking with respect to economic development. We identify all the areas that should continue to be and should be in areas of focus for the town. And the POCD provides a nice framework for economic development going forward. With respect to transportation, um, we, you know, we point to all of the needs. The town's done a very good job of maintaining its infrastructure, but every year it's a, it's a continuing challenge. And, and we've made a lot of recommendations specific to uh, expanding mobility for uh, different types of users, such as pedestrians, doing a better job of connecting uh, destinations in town with sidewalks for pedestrians and for bicyclists in addition to emerging forms of mobility, right? Micro mobility, which are uh, scooters and, and other forms of mobility that can connect your train station to locations um, and uh, building on your, your existing transit services and doing a better job of connecting to those. And, and we pr provide recommendations for all of that within the plan. Facilities and services, um, the, your, your community is blessed with incredible services and great facilities, but those require continuous maintenance and investment. And we point to the, the outst some of the outstanding needs and most pressing needs, one of those being a support of your volunteer firehouses. Uh, in addition to that, your infrastructure are part of the town facilities. It, and particularly your sewer and water infrastructure. And there are some tremendous needs with respect to sewer and water infrastructure uh, that we identify within the plan and provide recommendations uh, for how to address. And cultural resources. Um, the Worthington Meeting House is an incredible asset. Uh, it is in need of, of work and investment. And there's been ongoing efforts for several years now to repurpose this structure and fully restore it. And this is one of many examples of treasures that you have in your community that need to be protected and invested in that are really critical to the identity of Berlin. And so I think we've done a very good job of documenting that within the plan and providing recommendations that you can move forward with. Finally, the plan culminates with a future land use plan. This is a required element of any plan of conservation and development. And it's the intention of this plan as expressed in a map to guide zoning and land use. So 
unlike a zoning map, this plan and this map doesn't tell you what you can pull a building permit for or, or you know where you can build uh, commercial or or, uh, or a residence. Uh, it's more about thinking towards the future and how policy should be set regarding the use of land. So when uh, zoning amendments are considered, this plan should be referenced as a guide in making decisions whether or not to rezone a residential area to mixed use or whether or not to um, uh, upzone something to an increased density. And I think what, what you'll see in, in the map before you is that uh, this plan really tries to protect much of what is currently low density residential, farm, forest, agriculture, and open space by uh, really identifying the value and the importance of maintaining much of that area as parks or protected open space, rural, residential, or agriculture, and that's all the green. And in addition to that, we identify the areas where commercial development really uh, should be focused and is encouraged. And th that's because those are the areas where you have the infrastructure to support it and where it's least environmentally impactful. And those are the areas shown in purple and red and magenta. So as I mentioned, this map is a guide and it's a reference for the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's a reference for town council when making big decisions about zoning and land use across the community. And it's a plan that can be updated. It, could be up, it will be updated 10 years from now, and it can be updated in the interim too if, if conditions change in the community. Now, I, I talked a little bit about this already in, in terms of how the plan's recommendations are organized. And, and what, I, what I had not yet mentioned is that there is a single vision statement that unites the entire plan. And we came up, we worked with the committee to come up with that vision statement very early in the process. And the plan's vision statement really describes what it is that is important to the community. It describes your identity and really where you wanna go as a community. And, and it's, it's, it's front and center in the plan. And that vision statement we, we really used to measure all of the plan's recommendations, everything that was considered, everything that went into the plan, is it consistent with the vision statement and is it supportive of that vision statement? So the six goals I talked about earlier all tie into and support that vision statement. The strategies are, are all work towards the goals, which supports the vision statement all the way down to the actions. And uh, in terms of this of where the rubber meets the road, uh, we the plan is concluded with an implementation uh, plan or section. And that is where we summarize everything that needs to be done, right? This is the 10 or so pages that, that most department heads would print out and pin to a board uh, it's their guide for taking action and getting things done. And it summarizes everything that was discussed in the plan, puts it all in one place in a user-friendly format. It identifies the responsible parties, the lead entity, who needs to champion that action, that who needs to take on that strategy and own it, and who they need support from, so the partner entity. We also identify the priority level. Um, is it a high priority, something that needs to get started on right away, medium, low, and that guides the sense of urgency about those actions and strategies. And finally, through the course of developing the plan, there were a number of themes that emerged. It be just when I say themes, these are just ideas or topics that came up again and again and again. And we saw in our language and our discussions and comments from the community. And, and it really boiled down to 
four of them. So if you were to take this whole plan, you would say, well, what are, what are the big ideas? In four, four ideas, give me four big ideas of this plan. And they are grow the economic base, expand housing choice, protect environmental and cultural resources, and invest in facilities and infrastructure. And those can be seen on the left side of the table uh, in colored text. And so what we've done here in this table is we've identified each of the strategies and actions that ties in directly with one of those themes. And some, some of the plan's recommendations uh, connect with multiple themes, in which case it really helps you understand how important taking action on that particular strategy or action is because it's working towards multiple different uh, items that are really important to the community and that have been identified as important by this plan. So our next steps. Well, um, you as a commission need to adopt the plan. The, the plan of conservation development is a document that is uh, adopted by the Planning and Zoning Commission. They, they are responsible for preparing the update and, and ultimately they, they are the, the stewards of this document and of this process. Uh, so that's what is directly in front of us is adoption of the plan. Uh, once the plan is adopted, we will file it with the Connecticut Office of Policy and Management. Um, and then it becomes, uh, you know, it goes on state record, becomes official, and that really starts our clock ticking uh, for until the next 10 years, until your next plan. What, what we've also recommended within the plan is that you as a community consider the formation of a POCD implementation committee. And, th and this is something that's pretty common in it is that committee is typically made up of uh, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, but also members from other boards, commissions, committees, and council. And it's really important that there's a diversity of people that are represented uh, on that committee because you really need this plan uh, to be embraced and, and it needs to be engaged by a lot of different bodies across the town. For, for this to successfully move you forward um, towards the plan's goals and recommendations. So that's one of the recommend recommendations we make. It doesn't have to happen right away, uh, but it, it would be an, an incredibly uh, instrumental in supporting uh, the implementation of this plan. So with that said, uh, that concludes my presentation and I'm Happy to turn it back to uh, Maureen and Maureen, Joan. Maureen. Hey, thanks. <laughs> um, so here we are. Hi. Hi again. <laughs> um, do we have any uh, questions from the... Yes, Tim. Yes, I do. Uh, I've been just making a statement. Uh, I guess many meetings now. Uh, the facilities of the firehouses, uh, information is totally wrong. Uh, what page are you on? Well, on page, uh, is that a page number on or six zero section six point zero. Okay. Let me get to where you are. I'm sorry. Let me just get to where you are so I can. You're in six point zero, and your page at the bottom, right hand corner, down at the bottom. Oh, do the one in front of you. Uh, 76. 76. Okay, let me flip one more time. Flip. Okay, so what are you referring to as far as the Okay, the, the fire stations are not uh, numbered correctly here. Square footage is not correct. Uh, years built is not correct. Uh, a site, a couple of them, the site is correct. Uh, some is not like good. Kensington is... Uh, probably six acres, uh, it's got a 4.2, whatever. Uh, but the years of uh, time is the thing. East Berlin was the number, for, number one station in the, in the town. Year, uh, year Incorporated was 
1932. Okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, all right. Before you, before you continue to, yep. uh, Maureen, was the were, was this information something that was dragged in from the old one? Let me say, I think I have the old one. Yeah, I I, I supplied some of this information, Let and uh, it center. either got dragged in from the old one, or something. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, if I could speak, this information came directly from the assessor's data, and we, we did have some conversations about this a couple of months ago, but we have yet to have anyone provide us with anything. Um, I, 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 I worked it up and sent it to the planner, uh, uh, and uh, said that the, uh, like I said, the number one uh, fire station in Belton in, in Berlin is East Berlin Fire Department, 1932. Uh, number two fire department was Kensington, uh, 1952. Okay, they built a new firehouse in 19, uh, took out building permits in 1968 for a new firehouse, uh, but it was, uh, it was 1952. Uh, the uh, Berlin firehouse is not 1946, I know that. Uh, and Berlin is number three in South Kensington. Uh, it's not a 1970 building. It's an old school that was out there uh, and was built a long time before that, converted into a firehouse in 1970. Uh, I'm just, just looking through this information. If I think you would would like to get your information, not from the assessor's office, from the, the fire marshal or 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 the uh uh i don't know what you call it now fires fire the marshal no 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 the uh, fire marshal chief well well what well, yeah he's uh jim simons i thought i no I he does uh we had facility. checked and gotten numbers from him and updated so i'm sorry yeah i think it's been um, imported from the old one followed up properly and um, I just want to correct it before we go to final. Yeah, and the old plan, it doesn't really address the fire districts. I have the one that's. Well, no, no, not that, that, but the, the original drafts they were doing. I think it's been imported from there. It was changed once. Uh, at least I supplied the information to Maureen uh, back when. All right, so you're asking that we uh, just the information on the fire department to become section correct. six. That's that all. would be page seventy six. Uh, you know, because uh, fire department volunteer fire departments are very stickly. I'm number one. I'm number two. Whatever. Uh, so if we what to do uh, uh, thing. Well, you mean they'll they'll wrong. have a, a you know. In other words, they'll be upset. You no, know, they'll be upset uh, if the numbers aren't right and something's produced by the town. We would right. we would not want the information to be inaccurate and yeah. I'm sorry for that oversight. Um and we also end up using the document as a resource for accurate information in the future. I would go back to the old old reports as well. So of course we want accurate and yeah, uh, yeah. especially yeah, the historic information. Uh, no, okay. So certainly uh, those numbers can be verified. Fabulous job through the and whole thing. Say, even um, well, it would be at the pleasure of the commission, of course, but should you decide to vote on it tonight, that could be a condition of approval that we get those. Okay. You know, you would be able to do that. If uh, that's an edit, it, you wanted to prove with the following edits. That yeah. Would be edit. Okay. And I think Andre had a question. Um, and I I'm, apologize, was not part of the group that um, participated into this pro um, this document, but on, on page 75, should we be indicating that the town hall, this town hall was probably built in 75. The original town hall was on Winning to Ridge. Is it, is it the means to have, is this historical? I guess that's my question because the town hall, we've always had a town hall here and it was on Worthington Ridge at one point. This one was probably built in 75 and that would stand true for the uh, Peck Memorial Library that was on um, Farmington Avenue over by St. Paul's, the original. So I didn't know if this is historical. It depends. Some okay. of the information that is in there talks about history that okay. moves forward. 
and others doesn't it's not meant to be a history book okay you know that's not where yeah right. to for you historic you information okay thank yeah, if you. i could if i could speak to that elaborate on that um we we actually do provide some is uh a little bit of uh narrative regarding uh where town hall originally was and the role of worthington meeting house etc and that that's in the cultural resources section this section is facility section. So it's really about uh, the building and the facility. And, and it's in, really intended to focus on the facilities so you can plan for these facilities, the type of investment and maintenance that might be required in, in the facilities. So for our purposes here, we're documenting the buildings and, and the building that you're in at this moment. And it's really about that facility and, and not necessarily about um, the establishment of the town hall and in, in its historic roots. Thank you. Thank you. Is there sure. anyone else from the commission or from the public? Yes, June. Uh, just minor detail is um, since you've been going for two years, we've had an update maybe with a commissioner uh, alternate to John Dykin. Oh, yeah, of course we would update the, the um, those first pages for all current members, as well as referencing, for instance, that Sandy, although she's not a commission member still any longer, she's remained on the committee. Like yeah, that would be on the credits page. We will we'll make sure that we're yeah. well, I'll make sure that we, we will make sure that the people who participated, um, you know, through the two year process will be so noted because I know that different sections were taken over and shared uh, by different people. So, all right, terrific. Um, is there anyone in the public? Yes. Would I just ask that you come to, yes, use the microphone, state your name and address for the record, and we'll be happy to take your feedback. You might have to move the microphone. Yeah, just so that we make sure that we get it. And okay. I don't know, maybe. Hello, hello. Yeah, better because so, uh, I'm Mary sure. Catherine LaRose from 26 Woodruff Lane in Kensington. And I did attend a um, few, two or three of your public meetings um, and found them very interesting. Um, and, you know, when it comes to getting the public involved, it's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But since I was, you know, interested and wanted to go and I'm here tonight, there was just three areas that, um, I am most concerned about in town, um, having been here since 1976, when I moved to town. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm... That's okay, allergies. <sighs> allergy season. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, anyway, we're all suffering. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, so in, in the document, it, it talks about sidewalks and, and increasing sidewalks, improving sidewalks, and um, and the areas that they want to concentrate on. And of course, anything that leads down into Kensington Village, they want to add some, you know, uh, and and um, and certain areas where you might be accessing a public building or something. But for me, living in the older part of town in, in Kensington, um, they mention one part of Percival Avenue that they want to put sidewalks, but they don't mention the fact that Percival Avenue, I know it's a state road and I know it's going to be difficult, but it's a very uh, well-traveled, um, people drive very quickly and it's all older homes um, and families and older people. And we really need sidewalks that a person can walk a baby carriage or walk with a toddler. Um, or that I can walk on and not feel like at any point in time I'm going to get run over. So I'm really concerned about sidewalks in areas like that in the older streets, Robbins Road, um, you know, and Percival Avenue, because that's my area. So that's what I'm speaking to. The other area that I am concerned about in town is our water system. Um, and hearing more and more about the problems with our water system and the fact that we have three water districts and how inefficient that is and how they don't play well together possibly and the aging of the system. So that's a concern that I definitely have that has been addressed in the plan of conservation and development, but it, it, really the town needs to move that to a really high priority, I believe. And the third area that I 
personally care about um, is preserving our historic buildings. And we've talked and talked about it. And it's in the plan of conservation and development as being a priority. However, these buildings are still just languishing. Um, the old, uh, it, I guess it's now the Kensington Garden Center building or the old Art League building. Um, of course, the, the old town meeting house on, on uh, Worthington Ridge and others that are just languishing. And you know, when the roofs cave in, then they say, well, now we can't save it. So um, those are three areas that I just wanted to speak to. And also I wanted to say how amazing the document is and the work that went into it. And I think that the company um, that is has done the work has done an amazing job. So I wanted to thank them and the committee that worked on it um, back and forth. Um, it's an amazing document. I had nothing to do with 10 years ago. So this is all kind of new to me. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for your input. Anyone else? Okay, All right. Is there anyone online who wishes to comment regarding the document, Plan of Conservation and Development? All right, hearing nothing <laughs> or no one. All right, I, I think it was a I, I think it was a great document. I think you guys did a fantastic job in trying to address all the issues that we had as the commission, as the committee. Um, I think it does well to help uh, protect the character of the town and uh, the preservation of the open spaces while having a control over the growth. And I think that's very important um, for us to maintain is the control of how quickly and what direction we grow, because we all know that what's today's, you know, hot ticket item is not necessarily what's going to be a couple of years down the road. So we're we're being very thoughtful, I think, about where we want to see the development and how we want it to progress and how it's going to commingle with our existing community. So um, with that, I, I, you know, I thank I thank Tim for, you know, bringing it to light and Andre for her questions as well. Does anyone else have any feedback about the do document? And Mary Catherine as well. All right. One yes, one comment, go ahead. Um, and this, um, I, this is not the first plan of conservation and development that um, I've um, participated in at least um, observing the process to some degree, but it is the first time that uh, I participated in the committee um, to develop the document, and um, it I found to be a very rewarding experience. Um, and I think that um, it's um, exceptional in many ways because of the work that um, Francisco and your team have done. Um, you brought a lot of expertise. Um, with your group to the town um, and did uh, a lot of research. Um, there's a lot of fact finding behind uh, this document that uh, I'm not 100% sure we had in the past. And um, I, I think that the document really is more comprehensive than I feel it has been at other times. Yeah. And I don't want to forget to thank Jim Mahoney, too. Yeah, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Who sat through all these meetings with us and Maureen and the crew. So thank you to everyone. Anyone else? If we're doing shout outs, I think we should mention that New England Geo does something. New England yeah. Geo did and, and Dylan did and, some and walk. Of course, we have it all listed yeah. as we just yeah. on the credit page. But Yeah, I think we all deserve a, a little round of applause for ourselves or a glass of champagne seeing this to the finish line. Absolutely, absolutely take a bow. Anyway, so with that, so we're here to, yes. Would just wonder if based on the comments and I don't want to put them on the hot seat, but if Jim or, or Francisco has any response to the questions or comments that were made. Um, yeah, Jim or Francisco, do you have any questions or comments uh, regarding speaking specifically with regard to the sidewalks, but any of them about the sidewalk or, or elaborating based yeah. on the comments made and everybody disappeared. Oh, you're back. OK. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start or OK, I'll start and then I'll hand it over to Jim. Uh, I appreciate I definitely appreciate uh, the comments from the member of the 
public regarding the sidewalks, we do place an emphasis on the importance of connecting uh, areas such as Percival Avenue with sidewalks uh, for, for safety and convenience. Uh, and, and there's uh, that's one of the things that Krog had acknowledged about our plan was our planning for bicycle and, uh, and pedestrian connectivity and, and the, the plans that were included for trail connectivity as well for recreational riders. Um, and so I, I appreciate that comment. Um, with respect to Tim's comments, uh, as Maureen mentioned, you could you could basically vote to adopt the plan with revisions made to update or revise the, the dates of the firehouses as needed for accuracy. Uh, like I said, our information is best based upon assessor's data. If we can get more accurate information, we'll, we'll certainly plug it in. And that's really just a matter of changing uh, a few numbers in the table. So we're, we're happy to do that. I, I don't think it changes anything at all about uh, really the recommendations of this plan, because the plan ultimately recommends that the town be more engaged in supporting your volunteer firehouses. And that, that's really, uh, the mo I think, the most important thing to call attention to, and that, that remains unchanged. Um, so with, with that said, I, I'll turn it over to Jim for any comments that he might have. Just um, a few quick things. The um, Regarding the sidewalks, um, certainly appreciate Mary Catherine's comments on the sidewalks, water systems, and historic buildings of the sidewalks were kind of uh, radiating out from the center. We have existing sidewalk network. We have, we're trying, the first thing we're doing is, is uh, call them the missing links. We got a lot of missing links and then we're starting to extend from there. A, a lot of the places we're extending are really strategic in terms of where other sidewalks already exist in subdivisions. Um, we're moving in your direction, Mary Catherine, might take us a while. We do have a new, um, sidewalk grant application was authorized by the council will be submitting in July that will include a couple of minor segments, one on <laughs> Percival Avenue and Robbins Road. So um, try, moving in your direction, realistically, it's going to take a while to get there. But uh, even this project, which is, I, I don't know, the, the cost of sidewalk, sky, uh, sidewalks have skyrocketed. Uh, we have, you know, uh, our project that we're proposing now is going to be an eight hundred thousand dollar project, and it wouldn't it doesn't get us nearly as far as we would like, but we'll keep on chipping away at it. The water systems, um, we have strong recommendations that regard in, in, including consolidation of the three water districts, and the council has tried is in the process of trying to initiate a study of that topic. Um, and and my thoughts on historic buildings, I think, it comes back to, I think, some of the things Francisco said about implementation. I mean, we've got a lot of good recommendations in there, but people have to embrace them. The commissions, the, the town staff, the citizenry, you know, working together to embrace them. Uh, we can do more, I think, in the historic area. I think that was an area of emphasis in this plan, but it's a challenge because there's limited funding. And uh, we did for example, apply for a, a grant to renovate Ledge School this year. We did not get it, but um, we're working on it. So, um, but it's going to take a it's going to take a lot of effort, no doubt. And uh, so, hopefully, that will be an area that people will focus on in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I kind of want to wrap, well, not wrap up, to you guys, but the the comments from the staff with um, just a the reminder that um, the plan of conservation and development certainly lays out the plan for the town and the decisions. And, you know, we look to it and <clears throat> refer to it in our reports to you with regard to making the planning decisions, mm -hmm. development and whatnot, make, make scores and everything else. But it is also, and, and some of the, the references in it, um, because they're used, it's also looked at by the state when the town's applying for grants to see that those grants that we're applying for are uh, yeah. with our goals. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the, the um, factors were thought about hard by the committee to as goals that may also require funding. Yeah. And we look to it. Oh, that's good. We want to keep some of those words in if possible so that 
definitely. Yeah. It's, it's clear that that's a vision of the town. Yeah, definitely. And and just one last thing, because uh, I think June brought it to light with um, the acknowledgements. I want to make sure that we have uh, George Millard because he handled that whole affordable housing portion for that. And that was huge. And he did an excellent job. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge him, he and also Sandy Coppola, who was on this commission and then continued to participate. Um, um, and I want to make sure that she is also given a recognition as part of the committee. All right. Just a so, housekeeping so. housekeeping question for Maureen. Should we uh, just formally enter the CROG letter into the record of the public hearing? I probably. I think it definitely should be at it. Um, that would be great. That's the comment? Yes. Do we have to read it into? Yeah, you want to read? You feel like reading or I'll ask Andre? <laughs> no, you won't. You don't have to give any dates. <laughs> yeah, we well, yeah, sure. uh, Okay, so June 15th, 2023 to the Berlin Planning and Zoning Commission. Report on POCD referral, POCD 2023. Dash three, comprehensive update to the Berlin Plan of Conservation and Development for 2023. Commissioners, receipt is acknowledged of the above mentioned referral. Notice of this proposal was transmitted to the Policy and Planning Division of the Capital Region Council of Governments under the provisions of Section 8 23 H4 of the Connecticut General Statutes as amended. Comment, the staff of the Regional Planning Commission of the Capital Region Council of Governments has reviewed this zoning referral and finds no apparent conflict with regional plans and policies or the concerns of neighboring towns. Uh, Krog staff recommend or commends the town of Berlin for aligning closely with the Regional Plan of Conservation and Development on improving connections of existing green space and trails as well as improving connections for pedestrians and bicyclists. This impressive theme of connections is continued in the town of Berlin's efforts in expanding transit operations and options to improve mobility, accessibility for all ages and incomes. Furthermore, Krog shows support for the town of Berlin's willingness to explore mixed use options for more holistic and resilient living options for residents as well as support for the town's consideration of revising zoning regulations to allow for a greater diversity of housing options for all ages and incomes. Krog also appreciates the town's consideration for low impact development, as well as the other preservation and conservation methods outlined throughout the town's plan. The public hearing date has been scheduled for June 15th, 2023. In accordance with our procedures, this letter will constitute final CROG action on this referral. Questions concerning this referral should be directed to Jacob Knowlton. Distribution to the planner of Newington, Rocky Hill, Southington, New Britain, Cromwell, Middletown, Meriden, River Cog, South Central Cog. Respect respectfully submitted Jennifer Bardis Early, Chairman, Regional Planning Commission, William Rice, Vice Chairman, Regional Planning Commission, and Jacob Knowlton, Community Development Planner. Excellent, well done. Well done indeed. Okay, so do we have uh, a motion? Yeah, Can we have to uh, close, yeah. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion to close the public hearing. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dykin, for the discussion on this. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 As opposed, so moved. And I just lost my agenda. I'm somewhere in the process. Where did it go? Hang on. I'm a, okay. I can steal his. Right. No, I can steal Brian's. He doesn't mind. Okay. I just have to find my spot in time. Thank you. All right, so the next item on the uh, public hearing is going to be the proposed amendment and plan of planning and zoning staff to the Berlin zoning regulations for section 11 DD planned residential infill development. These are ongoing public hearings. So here we go. Um, we did receive the proposed text. Uh, 
I don't know how it went off. Okay. That one. There we go. Oh, oh boy. Thank you. That's very bright. Okay. All right. I don't know if he left or not. I can do. He's, well, actually, you know what? Hold on. Well, he kind of makes me giggle because he shows up, and then, and then I don't know if he left or not. Hey, uh, the dimmed a little. Okay, so we got these. Got these. Oh, wait. Oh, now it went off again. All right. Yeah, this one. The top one. Oh, it's a little. Is that a little better? Well, I know. So that's a, it's better than better than it was. You know, it was too bright on you. So okay. Trying to teach how to right. do it. All right. So we have a text <clears throat> amendment proposal that we received with some revisions in here. And have we all had a chance to look through it? I want to make sure that the record that everyone has um, the entire time included. Okay. Or has reviewed the record all the way through? Because this is a lot of public hearings. Yeah. I just want to make sure that anyone who who um, seats is seated for a vote. Yeah. Have reviewed the entire record as well as so oh. we had through the process and I'll just do an update. Yeah. I don't think we've done it in any of the most recent meetings. There were a couple of meetings that Commission Daily missed um once in February and once in May. Um one that Mr. Hamill missed here of course today. Um Commissioner Biella missed the end of April and the one in May, the one of the month in May, and uh, Commissioner Dakin missed the first several until he was put on to the commission. Diane, was one Diane missed? I'm sorry, I missed the well, oh. no action on the night that I missed. Oh, right, there was no. And the nights I were gone, I did watch the videos of the um, mission meeting. And you were here, Miss Millard, right? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, we can't vote on it. Okay. Yeah. 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 But for the night, so the listed nights are the nights that testimony was. Okay. It was a quick statement that day you missed. There was a quick statement about it that kind of updated where it was, but there was no new content. Yes that night or discussion that night. Okay. All right. So looking through the document, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Ms. Miller. Okay. Mr. Day can review the record or will you not? I, I did not. It was several meetings before. I may have watched one or one of those meetings. I definitely didn't watch all of them. So I will recuse myself from this vote. Thank you for that. We have a lot of procedural things going on around here. Yeah, yeah, I know. We have to be careful. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just got. So just reading this over, and I just get a couple comments. Okay. Yeah. So I, okay. Let me. Uh, no problem. Anywhere you want. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, on page two, under three C, um, it was changed. One one and a half stories, nor eighteen feet in height. I, shall exceed. So no building shall exceed one and a half, and a half stories, stories or 18 feet. Is it? Or do you want, or I don't know. No, no, or nor is like, fine. I like nor to me, it's a little more clear. Okay. Of course, that was me writing this. This is just little picky stuff. Is is that 18, that 18 feet, is that from the floor to the roof? Is that from the foundation to the roof? So it's from the average grade on each side. So it, according to our regulation, height is measured. In most instances, there's a couple of regulations where it's different. So for our general regulation, 
definition of height, you measure from the average finished grade on each side of the building. And each side has to meet the height requirement to for a pitched roof halfway between the soffit and the ridge. Okay. So if you have a pitch, it's halfway up. Okay. All right. Thank and you. that is the, the way height is measured across the, um, pretty much across the board in all residential. Exactly, farms or the, that zone has a little bit different a definition because of the sloping land. Mm -hmm. There was an amendment that really clarified that to the building mm -hmm. and how much percent of the basement is exposed. And it's mm -hmm. that's a complex, okay, or more complex than general terminology. I just want to uh, specify that a little bit. If it's 18 feet, it basically could be a cape type house because uh, eight foot ceilings is 16 foot with the, with the wood in between it. Uh, so you can, could actually have a cape halfway up that peak. You know, that's, uh, that's where, and I don't know if you remember during that testimony when I was explaining that modification, I was, um, the, my intent was to allow for that cape style. Yeah. So you get those steeper pitched roofs, they Right. A little bit, in my opinion, a little more architecture job. Is that with that? You know. That's with no dormer, though, like a cape with no dormer. Um, it would depend on the dormer. So, yeah, it, um, but probably, um, what we more typically refer to as partial dormers, doghouse dormers, that kind like of the thing. The gable dormer, full, like I have a cape. Once and... you get to a full dormer, mm -hmm. then your height is going right. up and your story is going up. So I have so a it really cape. It depends on how much of it. It's kind of a building right. thing. So it's like a gable dormer where it's just like in the front here and front here. Yeah, yeah maybe both even a full dormer half, and bad. Maybe even as wide as, you know, something that would be half the width of the house. So one and a half stories, would that be livable? A would that be, a, yeah, that be a room? They have the headroom within a certain... Um, amount of square footage is allowed. Eight to foot of... Yeah, they have, and I don't know what that height is. I think it's eight. Uh, eight, eight foot. Eight, yeah, eight foot, but, eight foot of headroom. It has to have eight foot headroom, so they could have a, a rest of portion of it. A bathroom up there, a bedroom. They could. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that clarification. If it was styled that way, if and again, if it is dorming out, that is square footage of of living space at right. dormer. So that you know, if it's a thousand foot. You know, every time you dorm it out, you're, you're grabbing a little bit more square footage out from down below, you know, so. And and the distance from where the eight foot is to where the pitch comes all the way down or mm -hmm. it meets the knee wall, you, you know, typically that's where, as I grew up in the people I know, put their dressers, you know, you put yeah, the things yeah, that don't yeah. need headroom yeah. against the wall. Maybe That, that was my old bed. bedroom or whatever. Um, no, again, there was considerable conversation back and forth. And that was one of the things that was edited okay. back and forth and right. is that the pleasure of the commission to decide where they want to land with it. But okay. it was my understanding in the last draft that that's where we landed. Okay. Um, an item D, no dwelling unit shall took out be less than 500 square feet, shall not oh. exceed a thousand square feet. What does that mean? My, my concern there is that we drove by these little houses over in, in Meriden um, that um, Carabetta built, and they are like tiny, tiny little things. They're they're so they're only uh, like 480 feet square feet. And where, where my concern is is what happens if we get someone who puts something under 500 square feet? And I want to uh, make sure I get this right, and I do know that our consultant's still on RIC that he is anyway, but, um, and I, cause I don't have the document in front of me, but I believe that that we, we discussed at the committee, the POCD committee meetings for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think the zoning meeting that the statute has us take the square footage out, the minimum square footage. We're not allowed to have it in our regulation. So the proposals mm -hmm. are to, to mm -hmm. eliminate language that we're not allowed to have. Which so is square footage. No one could come in and build anything less than a thousand square feet. That's what we're saying. No, I could. No, it can't be bigger than. 
Yeah, yeah, it big. can't be bigger than a thousand. It can't be bigger. How small can they go? As the statue is telling us they can go as small as they want, or as small as building code allows. I think building code still has a a, a limit of some livable space in order to make it livable. And that's something I'm going to say. That's really small, like 200. Francisco's nodding. So it, it's uh, it's actually smaller than that, Maureen. Um, oh, Lord. <laughs> Well, that's a yeah, bad but, but that's a bad I, I'd like to remind everyone that really market conditions will prevail. I you just won't be able to rent or sell something that's under a certain size. But the state does through Public Act 2129 does prohibit us through zoning from restricting units uh, to a certain size or or to a minimum certain minimum. But we just can't do that. Don't have that authority anymore. All right. Well, we'll we'll uh, determine the, uh, the square footage of the house. This that it says six units per acre. They're not going to do uh, six four hundred square foot units that they can't sell for much money at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they go build something that's substantial enough, thousand feet. Okay, that that is going to be a money maker to them. So market like. Uh, San Francisco uh, says San Francisco. <laughs> Francisco uh, said his market's go to demand it anyway. Uh, well, what size is going to be? If you go by this little parcel of land and that it's only three quarters of an acre and he has 12 units on it, Joan and I actually drove by it. it this thing, well, we walked it. it it's, we walked it. I mean, we went like this and we were almost we touching the business. Time, yeah. Literally touched the building. One house to another house. So you have one so bathroom looking at you, Even you say they may not build them, no one's going to buy them or whatever. Somebody somebody will rent something. So am I? Yeah. But And thank you for the answer on that. I got that. And um, on the last page, um, item K, a minimum of 400 square feet of usable screened private outdoor space shall be provided for each unit. So that I kind of took from another section of our regulations where you have multifamilies. I think it was the AA on the adult housing. I'm not sure which which section I took it from, but um, that's saying the the um, purpose is or intent is you know you have an outdoor patio mm -hmm. that's dedicated to the unit as opposed to walking out and being open and free to everybody else. This is outdoor but, space that's for that. And so I just so I took the language from other sections. That, that 400 square foot is included in the maximum of 1,000 square feet. No, so it's this outdoor. is an additional. It's outdoor space. So it's not square footage for the purpose of a, of a unit uh, size. Living space. living space. It's not living space. It's It's trying to meet the needs of a quality of life. Okay. So that people have outdoor space related to their, if it's, you know, when you have apartment style living, you have dedicated outdoor space. So we're so townhouses that have a dedicated outdoor space. Now these don't really provide for that in that okay. this regulation, but. So um, you're, so that would most likely be in front of the house because you're, we're asking for 20 feet in between each unit. You could be behind or behind, but it wouldn't be on the side. Unless they put more than twenty feet between. Okay. Okay. Or rather, I shouldn't say that they could. They could have ten and ten. Between, you know, they, as long as it's a private space, it's still to get around. That's part of the site plan yeah. as to how it would actually be designed. I don't claim to be able to. Um, yeah. So imagine every configuration somebody could come up with. We mm -hmm. try real hard to figure out what somebody could possibly interpret. Um, but that's a great thought there because I'm, I hadn't thought about the space between the unit and whether that would affect yeah. space or not. Yeah. Uh, again, I think it depends on the design. Yeah. The topography as to where it can be. We can make reasonable space exist because we're looking at six six unit dwelling units per acre. So oh. yeah, uh, Tim, oh, I'm okay. sorry, Andrew, you yeah. finished? Oh, that's good. Okay, Tim. Okay, oh, uh, three B, 
Uh, it says 20 feet between units, right? I think that's what you, you wanted there, like 10 and 10 on each side, right? No, 20 feet. 20 feet between units. So the prop, uh, uh, uses line or property line, the unit's got to be at least 20 feet apart. Okay, so. so one side's 10 foot and one side's 10 foot of the other one. So the units got to be 25 Perhaps, feet. Perhaps they might put walkways or they might, you know, to get to a common area or Okay, but it's got to be between, between, them. between units, they got to be 20 feet. Between their 20 outside feet. walls. Okay. There would yes. be 20 feet between yes. the walls. However, we did have in there um, that they could, you know, screen a small, I think I left it in there, screening a small, like, garbage area so that you know you can do something between uh i kind of took an example but then, oh, yeah and it's it's right it's like below the rest and yeah. i know and yeah bulk bulk uh table uh this is 25 feet okay to, where are you on this where to, uh, uh, that's uh g2 uh the next page i think okay g2 okay thank you okay uh the side says 25 feet that's to the side property lines. Of That's property. a side property lines. Like now, so so. Okay, now I see the property line words. Okay, because I saw the property line words in front of it crossed out, and then I didn't see it again on property line above residential. Okay, no problem on property lines. I didn't see the second property no. line on that that wording. Oh yeah, because I separated it out into yeah. one, two, three, four. Like I. Right. You, you, Made you, it read more like our the rest of our regulations. The the, the way it was um, in paragraph form is not the format we generally use in okay. our zone. So I tried to. No, find that's, yeah, that's fine. I just I just want to make sure it's properly regulations so yeah. you could find side front side rear. You know, when okay. you go through. And that's what we do. Mostly we have chart style. Yeah. Regulation. Um, can I ask you a question? I'm going to uh, ask about uh, same page that we were on um, with uh, his bulk requirements. Um, H, uh, I guess it's one. We talk about under square foot, 100 square feet providing. Uh, they're talking about, uh, I guess you're talking about uh, detached accessory structures. So point one. Um, it says 100 square feet provided they are limited to a single story with no wall greater than eight feet and a cert uh, certificate of zoning compliance is obtained with a minimum setback of 20 feet inside and the rear yards to be permitted providing there's a placement does not encroach on the approved buffer. Um, so are you looking at one accessory building for the lot for the whole development or per unit? Possibly per unit or however many. No, there's not. So this does not limit the number of ex total accessories. Um, although it could be for you. That, that I, would be a I, bad idea to put in per unit, but I was trying to respond to it should probably the thought be that you might want lawnmowers or gardening equipment mm -hmm. or something else to be oh. able to be stored neatly outside instead of in a under a tarp but i think else. yeah no and i agree with that and, but i think it but, should only be one not per unit because chances are you're going to have management i don't i can't see somebody going and having a lawnmower to do you know 10 feet here and you know, and for, that was a response to well, no, I under and forth that you guys had, and I I agree kind of landed where I could. But I think if we're, because of the size of the lots that we're dealing with, and the allowance for the houses to be up to six per per acre, I think it might be wise for us to limit it to an accessory um, to, uh, accessory pod or whatever you want a building to be for the care of the site. So, so let me just explain a little further. Then I, I might be concerned that 100 square feet be enough because if you have people with their, they, they do have toddlers and they have that cozy coop and that little slide thing and 
something else, then that takes up quite a bit of space to put away. Um, that if everyone has to have like a cage inside of, of an accessory, that may fit more the need of an accessory garage, which is the second one, the attached accessory structure that would be bigger. Um, this one, this, the provision for one was in response to thinking they might want a private um, storage something for their and that's gonna items. so either way I, i'm just trying to explain but yeah why, i'm just I, thinking that I, i'm hearing the back and forth of i have had um from my experience as zoning officer i would struggle with our the developments in town that were units where then they were starting to put sheds and then, then you get to the point where are they changing their um, impervious surfaces and everything else is an entire development? You kind of saw that when we, you saw the re-submission from Silver Ridge when they came back and said, but this is actually what ended up being out there 20 years later. Um, and so I was trying to provide language that actually would tell the commission, the zoning officer and the any resident coming in looking for an accessory structure what what are they allowed so what they are allowed i yeah i just do, should think about i encourage the ability what to if have you some did? language in here even if it or if it's language that says um private accessory structure is not allowed you know if that's where you're going i would encourage the use of some language that that or if you want to direction do, to the zoning office. Yeah, or if you want to do a single um, structure for the entire development and uh, limit the number of square feet allowed per unit. Yeah, that's uh, I would be more comfortable with that as opposed to having all these little little pods show up all over the place. Because so so that, like if would there's that be enough. So does that fit under two where it's a detached accessory structure? No. Well, no, because that would be. Yeah, well, I think what Joan is getting at, I think what Joan is getting at is to have a single storage structure for the entire mm -hmm. development. And so if it's going to be shared, um, use the same 100 square feet as the maximum storage area allowed per unit. So you don't end up with some monstrosity of a storage building and have it be um, kind of gauged by the number of units in the development. Mm -hmm. The only thought that I had heading that direction um, is an acre is a large parcel. Um, and if you do have children and toys and tricycles and wagons and so forth, and you use them daily or regularly or want to put them up at night or um, it, it it might be more convenient to have that little hutch closer to the home or accessibility, shoveling, planting, pots, you know, things that you would use on a regular basis. Yeah. Thought. Well, no, I, I guess if I was looking at one house on a single acre, but if I'm looking at six units I and a garage, but I, I just don't want to cover I, I want I don't want to cover the property with buildings. I want to make sure they still have some livable space and some green space or whatever. But I want to be sensitive to their needs. And most, um, I mean, a lot of people they get these garage and the first thing they do is they fill it with junk. I mean, how many how many of your neighbors know that they park the cars outside because there's no room in the garage? And I, and that's not a slight tour. I mean, it's just the way we are as a civilization. We have You're a tendency to buy stuff and we stick it in the garage um but and so i'm thinking that with bicycles and stuff i would never leave a bike outside i'd walk it right into my house because of you know just society being what it is so i can understand the point to want to store stuff like that but um i'm just trying to i'm just trying to keep the development pretty and maybe that's a that's not a good goal but we're only, I mean, just, uh, you know. We're only talking about a shed. 
That's 10 by 10. Uh, it might be bigger 10 by than some 10 of these said, houses. You're not going to get it. might be bigger than in. some of these houses. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. 10 by you 10. Don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 yeah, but I how many 10 by 10 though. sheds do you want? On well, top of the house, one, on top of one, the garage? One per, per house. Yeah, one so per So you got house. six houses, go be the, the your six so sheds. Could be six sheds. On but the then you're going to have six garages. You got to have six garages. So now you're looking at a house, a shed, a garage. You don't have six garages. It's it, it's a I'd be it's a bank of garages that you you did this says in here. Well, it is uh, the same thing. But uh, I'm just saying that it should have a limit. People people put a shed on their property to go one more than ten by ten. Okay, that's just every shed that you see anywhere in in Berlin uh, is probably almost but 18 it, by 10. But again, my, my point is uh, how big is their lot? I mean, we're talking about six units on one acre. One acre, yes. Yes. So you have you're driveways to, and road. Down and, to, uh, okay, one acre divided by six is what? <laughs> 43, I can't, I can't 000, do it on my phone. 43,000 is like 7,000. No, 7,000 well, square feet, right? 40,000 divided by six. What is it? Well, it's 43,000. Well, it's 43 acres. something. Builder's acres, 40,000. <laughs> yeah. That's what the general yeah. thing is. 40,000 divided by six. So you're almost R7 lot. 7,000 square foot. Mm -hmm. R7 lot is uh, Madabasset Street, East uh, Kensington, uh, uh, all, all that Murray Heights there. That's all 1,000 foot lot, uh, 7,000 7, square foot lots. They all have sheds in the backyard. You gotta have a, yeah, but a lot of these, a lot of these 7,000 are on a main street. They're all like, just adjacent to each other remember visually you've got to have a whole road come through a whole driveway i'm just saying you're you, you covering could, a lot of the surface you could put, with you, could put a, you could put a, a driveway in straight down the middle of a lot and three houses on each side of the driveway okay i'll right? so it's no different than okay let's do it four houses per acre oh no <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I, that's I'm I'm already going down. The, I'm already I'm, saying all right to six. I was I was arguing with eight before. Well, I was talking nine. five before, so I'm meeting you at six. But what I'm saying, <laughs> you're not gonna. No, I don't want you covering up that land. You're, 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 so so forty three thousand square foot. You got seven thousand. You got seven thousand square foot lots or or, or land Road. use land use area or land use area, whichever you want to call it. Okay, uh, minus the road, or whatever it is, driveway, road, whatever you want to call it, because this might be a dry, common driveway to six houses. Okay. Well, yeah, but it's going to have to make a loop around. <laughs> it doesn't have to loop around. Well, sure. You're going to get the I'll school bus. Get into the property. And then where? Three houses on each side of the, the, the driveway. Where's the school bus? Common driveway. Go? Where's the snow going to go? Huh? Where's your snow gonna go? Like any other driveway, like any other driveway, you you got you got a common driveway. We have common driveways in our town all over the place. Okay, uh, so if it's built that way, uh, you got three houses on each side of a of, okay. of a driveway. Uh, probably gonna be a twenty foot wide driveway or something. Okay. Uh, you know you're going to. You know, basically, what they're going to do is plow right the snow right to the end of the the, the driveway. Uh, you know, uh, that's what they're going to plow. All right, but, I don't want to. I don't want to get this. No, I'm just. Uh, I'm just Go ahead. I have another so, suggestion with yeah. regard to this because I think what you're taught the kind of structure that Chairman Bailey mentioned, um, where it would be a common storage mm -hmm. building, fits within two, which has greater setbacks because it's a larger building. A one H one was written for five H one was written for concept of individual storage units, and I know recently Dylan had had to look a couple of things up with regard to um, 
people that were applying for things. Um, and the like typical Rubbermaid ones, not the ones that come in on a truck as far as storage, but you might find those to be closer to a six by eight size or six by, yeah, six by eight, eight by 10, you know, is, is a little larger, but that's 80 square feet. You know, six by eight is even smaller, might fit a couple of bicycles and, you know, other things. But one of the um, thoughts I have is instead to have it be within five feet of the house. So for instance, it's where those the garbage cans get put mm -hmm. instead of behind a fence along the side of the house, you put them into those kinds of storage sheds. But if it's within a couple of feet of the house, and I say five because then you can mow around it and you don't get things living between it and the, you know, yeah. they might, you might put it right up against it, but at least gives you the opportunity to be able to mow around it. Um, puts the bulk of it still visually with the house but allows for those what? individually okay. controlled what? um and it's small those are those are kind of small so if you, what, you so want that's what want one to is is the idea of the smaller ones because the setbacks were written for less to the sides and rear main main property lines the property lines of the of the parcel um where once it gets to the bigger size i would suggest from what i've heard from the feedback is that you want it to meet those larger setbacks, which is what two has half the required distance with site plan approval, et cetera. It's a larger building. If you it's go build, you know, it's a building, it's not yeah. a trash shed. Okay. okay. Andra? If, if so we is that if it goes on the side of the house, is that that's cutting into the 20 feet between each home? Yeah. That's what I was envisioning that, you know, people could put their garbage cans along the side of the house behind a little fence. Which takes away from any type of walkway that would be put in there, right? Um, like, yeah. like I said, I mean, I went off the, I know, my I dad's know. development, which is what it is. It, there's 20 feet between the units. Pretty much each unit has a walkway. A, there are, I think there are about four or five feet deep fencing along the side of the house and then a walkway outside of it that's, a, that's like three feet and then the next unit has it in their walkways some of them share their walkway but most of them because okay. they, they are actually separate lots okay they yeah. are just yeah. each other i was just envisioning if, yeah if you're okay. talking a bank of garages which i just saw in here okay so a bank of six garages it could be carport it could be with a door on it, but a bank with six garages, what a lot of the condo associations, uh, con condos do, is put a little storage area in the back of the garage. So it's eight foot out more, or nine foot out more with the garage. They put all their bicycles and everything in the back of the garage. If you don't want sheds, that's the way, the way to get rid of the sheds. If you don't want to do that, it's just, just required that the storage is in the back of the garage of the, the, the garage ports or garages, whatever. So there's only six garages. So it's not that much of a size of a building. Uh, and you're going back, say eight feet or nine feet, uh, you know, and with a little door with a lock, lock on it that you could put your stuff in. Yeah, or cabinet you know? in there. You know? Yeah, that's a better compromise. That's the compromise. That I would suggest that you edit this to eliminate the choice. All right, so we, okay. Suggestion. Yeah, eliminate the sheds and, and say that the storage area in the back of the-, the, the Yeah, the garage is going to have self-contained cabinets in the back or something or whatever they want to do. Is that a good compromise for That's you? That's a good compromise. Okay. okay. I, I knew we'd get there. got close. I knew we got. <laughs> I only got, almost got the four, four unit breaker. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. All right, come on. Okay, anything else on this? I mean, other than that, I thought it was. Uh... Okay. Holy mackerel. Um, question, just really quick on item f, uh, uh, f because I know I don't want to go too late with this. Um, just item F when it talks about the affordability. 
Uh, let me see, containing confidence of restrictions of perpetuity, which require that dwellings units be sold at or rented or below prices that would preserve the housing units for which persons and families pay 30% or less of income, which such, where such income is less than or equal to 80% of the medium income. Can we just sort of tighten that sentence up and it should basically say uh, with the affordability equal to? So this, I used the language that was already there, which was really um, reflective of the statute. Um, and we've used similar language. I didn't change it to the language we use in other provisions that we're trying to make more consistent. I'm yeah, trying to make that the same consistent language, um, but that's why I added the first sentence with the supplying housing units that by, uh, qualify as affordable in accordance with the statute is so that if that changes by some um, legislative action before you get to update it, it's the intent that is still there that it meets the, the qualifications. Um, we've had many discussions of those housing units that were approved back in the 90s and the language that they were approved under doesn't okay. meet, didn't doesn't meet the adding our percentages adding okay. to our, our numbers all right all right that was the last comment i have anyone else okay steve Biella, do you have any questions I can't talk. I know. <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, I've got all set. Thank you. All right. Thanks You're for welcome. making fun of me, Tim. No problem. No problem. All right. So, do, any any notions to make a motion from the commission here? Commissioners available? Uh, I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Okay, great. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Miller. Further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed, so moved. Okay, and we do not have to deal with Thomas Kokomo because he's already been motioned to continue. Going on to the old business, and I know you're waiting for this, the plan of conservation and development 2023. So um, we've all had a chance to give feedback. Any motions? I make a motion to approve with the the uh, changes to the fire department things uh, as proposed uh, and the map map uh, showing where the fireplace apartments are because that's wrong too. Uh, but uh, those changes to be made. Yeah, with and the acknowledgement. Yep. Yeah, with Mary Catherine's comments. Yep. Yep. Sure. Okay, we're good on that and acknowledgements will be cleaned up. Okay, so we have the motion by I'll Mr. Make a second. We have a second by Ms. Dorsey. Further discussion, so all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? So moved. Yay. Yay. And Steve Biella. Sorry, I can help you myself, I... Okay, you got an eye on that, thank you. All right. <laughs> okay, yay. Well, all right, so you move on forward. All right, so then we go on. Quickly yeah. remind everyone. Perks. Quickly Before remind. Our consultants leave. We do have a plan of conservation and development committee meeting. We're continuing the discussion of the zoning amendments next Thursday. And I believe we were going to post it as a combined meeting with the planning and zoning commission. All right, and that's July. Uh, that's the that's my that's june 22nd i believe yeah we're not in july yet although all right and what time is that meeting is that what time i'm i don't well i'm looking at francisco too i'm thinking yeah. he's i saw thinking, six oh, 6 30 6 30 is what i have yeah uh, 6 30 yeah, is that what yes. you have francisco yes. okay you guys at 6 30 commission 6 30 yeah. all right terrific yes all right. I interrupt, but I Yay. Let's all go home and have champagne. Not morning, yet, but morning, we're almost yes, done. I notice I'm fine. We're almost done. We're almost done. Okay. And now we're to the uh amendment for the planning and zoning staff for the regulations for section eleven DD planned instant residential infill development. Okay. So what do we want to do with this? 
I make a mo. Oh. Well, good night. Good night, left and right. Huh? Yep. I make a motion that we continue uh, for the, the couple uh, revisions that we discussed tonight uh, and put it on under old business next time just for a vote. Yeah. Yeah. You want to continue it? Well, I just want to continue it for she can change those changes, make All those right. changes, and then we vote on the next meeting, just bring it up and vote on it. All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Sigma. We have a second. Oh, no second. Okay. Then, so do you want to make a motion? I, don't I, don't I had a feeling. Recent years. I was in the motion. I, I can't get a second. That's fine. You got to you gotta rescind. You make a motion. <laughs> I think you just declared the motion fails. Well, Madam Chair, yeah. yeah. That's all. Well, that's what I that's did. All. I said next. That's all. <laughs> Diane, did you want to make a, anyone else want to make a motion? I will make a motion to approve the proposed amendment um, with the changes that we discussed this evening. Okay, so we have a, uh, do you want, do you need that to be specified or we're, we're clear on that? I, I think two. Well, I think so. Um, to remove uh, paragraph H five H one. And what did we have another change? And the other change was no, we just had actually just verifications. Clarify, um, clarify that the uh, um, storage will be in within the garages for the units. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, at the end mm -hmm. of this sentence on detached accessory structures, there's no detached structures anymore. Such as the bank of garages. And put um, no private detached accessory structures permitted. Mm -hmm. The final sentence after yeah. what will become H1 or yes. not even have a two. Yeah. No, it won't have a. She's going to. Detached accessory structures will not be allowed. Well, two words are coming out for two. Oh, two is going in. No. Yeah. Two becomes one. Or no number at all. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, two becomes yeah. Banks of garages, storage of community maintenance. That's all accessory, right? Yep. And just add a sentence at the end. No what is it? No private detached accessory structures allowed. Oh, good to me. Okay. Yeah, I think we're okay. Move with the changes as noted. All right, so we have the motion. Do we have a second? A second. Okay, Ms. Miller. Further discussion? So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you, Steve. <laughs> and any opposed? Steve. Uh, that was Steve Viella voting aye. No. Okay, and no opposed? And John no. abstained. He's abstained. And did you vote, John? Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't hear. All righty. All righty. I believe you. All righty. So motion passes. It's Yay. approved. Yay. Another thing off of our list. And with that, uh, planner comments. Do you have any comments? I have. Several and I'm sorry for that. No. <laughs> However, that's okay. Give me, give me one second because no, that's okay. I messed up my files doing that. Now I have the time. I called it for that. So this should all be happening. I can't push it now. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, okay.
Where did it go? Okay, so I do need to make a clarification. Um, I think we all got confused a little last month when we were making the 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 when the motions were being made with regard to the um, public hearing dates. The public hearings for 1676 Berlin Turnpike applications, they were called two-part applications, and um, 1906 Berlin LLC applications. Um, the 1676 is actually legal house living. The first couple of motions were on 1906 Berlin LLC for the text amendment and the site plan, and those were bundled and the notice of decision noticed them both happening on July 6th. That was what we were advising as staff. That's how um, myself as well as corporation counsel saw them coming through. It's, co it's confusing when you listen to the tape that those weren't the ones separated as opposed to that bundle being separated from the the little house living applications as a separate bundle. That's what we were talking about separating. So we noticed, because we already sent that notice to the paper, that for July 6th, or we already we sent the notice of decision actually from that meeting out that July 6th will be the both applications for the text amendment and the 1906 site plan. And then the July 20th is the date that was set and noticed for the um, Little House Living and text amendment and site plan. The text amendment is the same. However, they were applied for separately and it, 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 we're just keeping them separate for now. It's the same text for both of them. So if you put them to the light, they're the same text. Um, we read them to each other. We got, however, each application is dependent upon the text. So they have to apply for the text in order to have the application be valid. The text is intertwined. So I wanted to get that straight because it was confusing when you listen to the recording to know that that was what was set, but it was noticed in fact. And I did check with our attorney and she was like, no, absolutely. Those were the dates that were discussed. It just doesn't come across that way. <laughs> and by unless an extension is received, both the applications relating to 1906 have to be opened by that first date of July 6th, unless the extensions are received. Again, we don't really know how they're progressing at this point, as far as that goes, but um, that's the scheduling. So that's the first thing, and I needed to clarify that because I feel like it was something I said that caused the confusion. So I wanted to make sure everybody's got that. Um, I want to let you know that, um, well, let me, let's go with the inquiries first. Um, we did have an inquiry to put another discussion on the, on the commission meeting, um, but maybe I'll, I don't have enough information yet, but um, there's been inquiries with regard to 398 Chamberlain Highway. It's been the garden center use. It was Kensington Garden Center a number of years ago, the commission put, um, quantified what would be allowed is at a garden center and the inquiries are coming in for maybe uh, adapting that a little bit. So would the, um, so we may be bringing to the commission another, a discussion item with regard to that. I would like to be able to put it onto the agenda and list it if, if the discussion is gonna happen with regard to that. Um, but there is some, possible positive movement there. Um, we also have a, a, a inquiry regarding um, bottle and can um, um, return center. So what 
we found some towns have is they have in their regulations something called the redemption center. And that's, I think, the term that the state uses for that type of facility. Um, I've experienced one kind where it's very much like the one next door to um, that it's part of, say, stop and shop, where it's just, you know, you, me, and everybody else going in and returning your bottles and cans. But there's evidently others in the state that are more large scale and they regularly get the Boy Scout trucks loads full and other truck loads full from collections. And so they operate that way. And so what I'm looking for is a little bit of feedback from the commission as to whether they would, um, whether it, one, if you've ever discussed it before and or somebody has some knowledge with regard to it, because we were, we were trying to categorize the use in the regulations. Is there a use in the regulations that the intent was for that something like that to fit under? Or um, if somebody's looking to come in with something like that, should they be bringing forth a text amendment? And whether or not you would, um, whether or not we should be thinking about um, separating it from something like a retail ed redemption center, which would be more that kind of thing that fits in, that, that's more like the accessory uses that um, Stop and Shop has as far as having them or, or grocery stores and liquor stores have, or should we, and it versus a larger scale that needs to accommodate more regular truck traffic, or should we just call them all redemption centers and put them in? in all together and whether anybody has any feedback or guidance if you've had any experience with them where you can just kind of send us in a direction. There are some in Connecticut, there are some. Where did you find one was? You found it, you have a couple. There uh, twins are ones. Um, I understand there are redemption centers, but I don't know the scale they are. So we know some of the towns have them, like, like Wallingford has one that's in a strip plaza and we go to. Um, I know, um, I've been told East Haven, North Haven have redemption centers. I don't know if they have the small ones or the large ones. We didn't get that far yet. I just kind of want to know what you guys are thinking about whether you whether they are already considered, say, a recycling center. I don't think they're the same as a recycling center, but you guys may have said, oh, no, those are the same as a recycling center. I don't think and, they are. And, right. So the center, they bag, and they wear. Right. So we are talking about so yeah, and that's what we understand. This inquiry is for the larger kind. Recent legislation that just changed this session. He's got to know that stuff. The greater need will be coming up. All right, so we'll. Uh, I, I'm. I'm hearing. I'm hearing text amendment is what I'm hearing because it is unique and and it is a its own specific use. It's not 
falling into another category. That's, and that's really what I needed the guidance as to whether you had, um, I want to, Yeah, and again, it would be a, a greater conversation, but, um, you know, and that would be up to anyone to decide if they wanted to, but, but we, the concerns have been raised. Um, um, I wanted to let you all know that there is, because this has been a problem that is brought up at other commission meetings, I'm not sure you guys have brought it up very much, but um the old Venerup property on 2215 Chamberlain Highway, where the greenhouses are has been sold this week, it was just sold. Um, we understand and we don't have a lot of information yet, um, reached out to the new owner, but that they're gonna be, a, a, they plan to be an agricultural use. We'll determine if it's one of the as of right uses or if they intend to do other things. Um, and we're all still working on, or we're hoping they're still working and we're still pushing for them to work on moving the access and parking easement for the conservation area to two lots south where, so that lot has had a general access and parking easement so that people could um, get to the trails that are to the east of the property. And we've had a lot of enforcement problems with the property being secured and you can't get in there. So he said he removed it. Okay, he, so he removed the locks, but he didn't open the gate. Well, well, hopefully he'll open the gate this week and we can, the, what ha was happening in the past and with past operators of the site, there were conservation signs up that said parking for conservation, you know, for access to trails and they would regularly disappear, get knocked down, still, you know, who knows where they went. Um, it was a constant or a, a regular issue. Um, what the, uh, the gentleman who bought the other properties south of there from Mr. Benerup, um, worked with Conservation Commission and others. He's developed a little bit of a parking area and has a trail plan to get down, a trail to walk down through the conservation that's easements that's on that property and get down further. However, these are documents that the private owners have to figure out how to write up the documents and then present to the town so the town can accept the movement of the easement. And with this new owner, it looks like we might get some movement on that. So that's kind of exciting. And I like to tell you exciting things because we talk about a lot of bad things. <laughs> okay. You know, do you know how much 2215 is? Uh -huh. Now that lot is not open space. That that does, is not conservation area. The conservation it's it's only to park on it for conservation. I just wanted to make sure that wasn't the question. That is a fourteen point eighteen acre lot in the POD zone. Um the um the Y has started moving their dirt. We've had um we had one complaint last week, contacted them because of the trucks driving to, that was just driving too quickly. I think that's all that was. Both the police and, and staff um, attempted to handle that. Today, we got a number of reports, the director of the Y, as well as the, and that was for dirt in the road, for um, the speed of the trucks, et cetera. Paulie went out, actually followed a truck that was not speeding. And, um, but the director of the Y and their um, construction coordinator uh, immediately both responded and Paulie met. I think he met them on site, but he certainly was out there and they were, we were all in communication. So it's being addressed rapidly and they're responsive. Whether they're, so Camp Sloper in Southington is dredging the pond and the, the dredged material was approved to come to a property on Southington Road, which is Makachi now, um, across from Timberland. 
and there were very specific parameters put on the plan for the traffic, the making sure there's no dirt in the road, there's no jake breaks. Oh, he, he immediately addressed the jake breaks and the, um, yeah, the, the those noise factors, the slamming tailgates. So um, actually one of the commission members told me that they had heard the jake breaks. They did not. I don't think the report included um, those other things. That was, those weren't happening, but the, but the and the dirt certainly was. Ah, and then I had an inquiry. Can you bring this one up? The why? I mean, uh, Eversource. So Eversource just wants to make a slight modification to their fencing, and yeah, it's because of the, um, just the the orientation of things, I think, as they went out there to, to move the things around. Um, it's not, it's the training facility. The second page shows the modification of the minor, the modification, let's see, I'll read it right off the plan. Relocation of the train link fence, gravel drive and storage building in blue. So they're pulling the, and I, and I don't even want to say pulling it out because it's, not really pulling it. I, it's it's a very short distance, but because the commission was very specific, I didn't want to just say, you know, it's a minor adjustment and I want to make you guys aware and make sure that there's not an issue. It's all still with um, within the open area, no disturbance of the existing tree line or anything else that's still north of that or to the top of that. I wish he'd put it on here so that, because I know that was a matter of concern. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a hold of him to tell him I was going to try to get it onto the agenda. Um, and just kind of, you, you can see it's just a shift out and over a little here and there um, and whether I can handle that administratively. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate that. Um, and so Diadio has not gotten. So is he has his? Um, actually, he did get the sign off from the state. I'm not sure if he got complete sign off from the state yet. Most of the delay, the lengthy delay on the project south of Deming Road has been permitting from the state. So that's been a, a real thing. I believe we have an active permit now because they wouldn't even let the, the, his, the site for this to the south was the first phase, the gas station and, and store was, uh, they would not allow even one permit to go until they approve the entire thing. So that one, I believe they have started to um, come back to the town for moving forward with. And I think he needs to do a few other items to get us to allow phase two, which is where he's got the, um, the multifamily units. And then as far as the one um, up near the Acura dealership in Orsini, I know they've put in the foundations. I know at one time they were having trouble with supply, but I don't know why they've stopped. We, that they had, we had reports for a while about supply but now I don't know why it's continued. I would think the supplies by now. And the I was gonna say, we there was the assumption in the office that the increase of interest rates has, may have slowed a couple of the um, excitement, some of the excitement. I, I think those conversations are trying to help with those.
No, I did get that inquiry just this week. I somebody else asked me that this week. So a conservation commission. So they asked the same question. I we um one of I believe one of those commission members noted that the gas company was doing doing their thing. Uh, oh, okay. So we do regularly, and I, you know, I try to keep them in my brain, but we get the uh, um, notices, either our office or the town manager's office or the engineering office. And sometimes we all get them. And sometimes one of them us gets them and we alert the others. The utilities usually notify us if they're going to be doing work throughout town. I might have gotten one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But but I do believe it's just it's gas company and we really no approvals required. But we're trying to, yep, yeah. But we didn't come up with anything too great. Just a little pickets. They they had ones that had a little just the pickets between. Yeah, they just show a little bit, yeah. but it's still a pretty rectangular. We we had trouble finding anything with indulation, but it, not that we found examples of very well, but but we'll um we'll we're continue. I'm I'm wondering if that's in my drafts. I'm wondering yeah. if the email to the response to him is in my drafts. I've, I've seen it's been a <clears throat> a busy week for for gates. I've seen the ornate designs with the the angles and the curves. But when it comes to longer border fencing, there's nothing really more or anything but just a couple of spires on each of it. Yo, yeah, yeah, there's other than the low end Oh, uh, yeah, I have not heard much. We, I only got one inquiry, which was not feasible in the other half. Okay. okay. The 